Hello, everybody. We're just giving everybody a second to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. So hang tight and we'll be right with you. While we're giving everybody just a second to join, um, if you haven't yet already, just take a look at your controls. We do have a space um, for questions. Um, so we are gonna have some Q&A time at the end. So um, if you have questions, uh, fill them out at any time they occur to you. Someone might say something that sparks something. Um, you can add them in there. Um, also, there are a couple handouts attached to this presentation. Um, that are resources that the Department of Tourism and Kate Larson were kind enough to uh, put together that hopefully you will uh, find helpful as you as you go through this. I'm just going to wait, I think, one more second. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. We've got a pretty good mass of people here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with introductions. Um, welcomes and thank you everyone for joining us today for this session on preserving difficult and authentic history along the Underground Railroad. Today's session is part of our Old Line State Summit um, online this year. And thank you to all of our speakers for being with us today. You can see we have a fantastic panel with us today. Um, my name is Jessica Felt and I'm the Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Maryland. Um, we just have a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will be continuing uh, sessions for the summit throughout 2020. Our next session is going to be uh, exploring the work that was done in Brunswick to create a conservation district. Um, and in the future, we're gonna have sessions on retrofitting the suburbs and cemetery documentation. Those dates will be announced soon. Um, more information and registration for upcoming sessions, as well as if you missed any of our past sessions, um, we do have links to the videos of those sessions up on our website, um, which is presmd, preservationmaryland.org, or you can go to oldlinestatesummit.org. Um, I also wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors uh, Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisenbrandt, Brennan and Company, and the Middendorf Foundation. Our sponsors, along with the support from members and donors, make it possible for us to present these sessions for free, and we really thank everyone for all their support. Um, so our panel is, uh, we are going to start with Liz Fitzsimmons, uh, Managing Director of the Division of Tourism and Film. Uh, Liz has been a marketing, marketing professional for more than 20 years, and has been with the Department of Tourism since 1999. Next, we'll have Heather Earth, who is the Partnership and Outreach Manager for the Maryland Office of Tourism Development, where she has worked since 2014. Uh, prior to joining the department, Heather worked as a museum curator, designer, and educator, creating a variety of visitor experience, experiences at museums and historic sites. Then we will hear from Kate Larson, who is a best-selling author of three critically acclaimed biographies, including Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American. She's consulted on future film scripts, uh, most recently the focus feature film, Harriet, as well as documentaries, museums ex exhibits, animation and augmented reality productions, print and digital publications and public history initiatives, including Maryland's Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State and National Historical Park. Uh, Dr. Larson has completed more than 20 successful um, NPS Network to Freedom applications. 
Um, and finally today, we are going to hear from Dr. Dennis A. Doster, who is a scholar of African-American history with over 15 years of professional experience in the field of public history. Currently, he, helps, he heads the Black History Program, which is a unit of the Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, and so if you are just joining us, I went over a little bit about how you can ask questions. There's a um, question box at any time. If a question occurs to you, please enter that question and we will have time at the end um, to read those out. Um, also, there are a couple of handouts in um, the handout page, which the Department of Tourism and uh, Dr. Larson prepared um, for your use as you move forward. Um, and so now I am going to hand this over to Liz. So one moment while I pull up that presentation. And I will take myself off of mute. Welcome everybody. It's really great to be here for the um, Preservation Maryland's approaches to preserving authenticity on the Underground Railroad in Maryland. Um, we've been working on the Underground Railroad Initiative for more than a generation. Um, Kate's been along for the the whole part of that from the beginning when we were building the the route and then to the culmination, or and actually isn't a culmination because it just really was another beginning of the opening of the state park. And, you know, the reason I'm here is, aside from an amazing amount of admiration since I was a little kid on Harriet Tubman, I was given a, a book when I was little and Kate, all the history is wrong, but the, the grit and determination that Harriet had in that story came through and then to be able to get to the Maryland Office of Tourism at a point in my career and being able to help bring that that amazing human being to so many more people. So what do we do at the Maryland Office of Tourism? We are really fortunate to promote this amazing state and all of its assets for the economic benefit of the citizens of Maryland. Tourism in Maryland is an $18.1 billion industry and it saves every Maryland taxpayer almost $1,200 on their taxes if, to pay for those goods and services that we all use, our roads, education, public safety, and that type of thing. So that really is what we do and why we do it, and it is to continue to support a thriving tourism economy that is definitely on, on the ropes right now with COVID and lack of travel, but there's lots of bright spots, and September is one of those bright spots. Can we go to the next slide, please? So that's Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, who joined us on September 1st at the Frederick Douglass Park on the Tuckahoe to unveil brand new exhibits to really tell the story of Frederick Douglass and his early life on the Tuckahoe. Um, last year was our first, I'm getting um, conflicting things in my mind. So this park is really a product of hard work by the county, the Department of Natural Resources, and then a private donor to assemble this amazing piece of land on the Tuckahoe that looks very similar to what it looked like when Frederick Douglass was a young, young man. And it really just has been quite the journey. Last year, Governor Hogan proclaimed the first International Underground Railroad Month. And Heather will remember there were a lot of folks who said that when we said things such as Maryland is the most powerful underground railroad storytelling destination in the world. <laughs> that people kind of said that that's a bold statement, but we believe it to be true. And with Kate's work and Heather's work on gathering more Network to Freedom sites, it really is. And Lieutenant Governor was really amazing at the site uh, last week. And he spoke about bringing greater awareness to the history of our state and encourage people to look into the lives of Douglas and Tubman and others who have faced adversity. And his whole speech was amazing. You can go to the live stream of the event, but he did an amazing job. And then when we declared International Underground Railroad Month, Heather, I believe we had Canada. So we felt like we, we covered international. And then we went on our way and kept talking about this. And Heather's work with the Network to Freedom again. And then I met with our uh, state tourism directors from across the country. And we 
had a really deep discussion about what this is and that the states that have joined us are Iowa, Michigan, Kansas, Missouri, North Carolina, Illinois, Kentucky, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania are still working on their official state proclamations. Now, only because I am who I am, you know, I suspect that with this type of nationwide collaboration that we will be able to at some point maybe work to get a national underground railroad historic trail it's, it's not without the realm of possibility to be able to tell the this i always get myself um kind of confused when i say stories because it sounds like we're making this stuff up and we're not you know i always say about harriet tubman you know she was a superhero long before marvel ever created superheroes so but um, let's go to the next slide, please. And these are the exhibits, um, or the unveiling of the exhibits. And it really was a great day because now people, when they come to the park, not just having the park in name only, but being able to tell those incredible stories. Again, it was an, a perfect partnership with our friends in Talbot County and Ann Kyle in our office, the design firm. and it again it was another um moment where tears come into your eye or come into my eyes and you know hairs get raised on my arm and just realize the impact of being able to share the, the life and legacy of frederick Douglass. and they do provide the interpretation i think i need to go to slide four there we go um it's all about interpretation and being able to travel to the other sites that are on the Frederick Douglass. Um, we do have a driving tour. And the park development is going to be ongoing, and we're going to continue in our office with our partners to tell the story of Maryland's freedom fi fighters, the Underground Railroad history, and the story of all of those that are involved in the Underground Railroad. And again, it's been more than 20 years. We want to develop the places and provide information so that visitors can travel to learn the history, see the sites, and perhaps have a moment of reflection about the hard discussions that are out there that you know need to have light shed on them and to be able to talk openly about where we were, where we are, and where we want to go. And having these shining examples of heroes here is really important. So we do market this. I, you know, I, I, I started off saying that we, we, we market Maryland to the benefit of Maryland citizens through economic activity and transactionable outcomes. We want people to come and learn of these amazing places, but know that many people don't, you know, if I could see everybody, I would ask for, you know, hands. How many people have gone on that road trip with their parents that turn into forced marches to see every insert historical site here? and people do that and we want those people to do that here but we don't want it to be a forced march we want it to be reflective and a great conversation at a restaurant like cracking crabs and enjoying an adult beverage and being able to see the places where these amazing things happened but then to also go to those other amazing amenities that our state has to offer and spend the night in a great hotel or b and b or a shared rental and really take in this whole experience. We market it. We The one thing that we do know right now is in what I call the new normal and hope for the next normal and this later normal is people want to take road trips. People want to be in outdoor spaces. They want to take road trips because they're comfortable in their car. And we're building a whole marketing program right now. We're still promoting the International Underground Railroad Month, as we will do through the end of September. We're rolling out our road trip promotions um, September 21st for our fall travel. So we know road trips are really big, and we'll be promoting the byways. Um, we have 18 of them in the state of Maryland. And the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway is one of those, and then the Frederick Douglass Driving Tour. And we market these domestically and internationally. So. What are the opportunities? What are the benefits to this? And it's to tell the real history. You know, I I spoke earlier about this book that I had. And, you know, when you talked about, you know, the Underground Railroad history in 
Americana. It's all about the Civil War, Civil War, and then there's this other piece of it that was kind of like it. It happened, but it it didn't get the the share that it should have gotten. And so, really being able to tell that real history and to get people from everywhere to come here to learn of that history and to learn of that grit and determination and really see it in those spaces. We're so lucky that those spaces still exist, that the Tuckahoe Park exists, that the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway um, State Park and Visitor Center exists right next door to Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, which creates a landscape that looks so similar to what was then many of much of it is still now and being able to do that in those spaces and we work with businesses to be able to help them and tell that story because you know one of the things that always fascinates me is you know people are you know and we do it about our own neighborhoods it's like well why would you ever come here well we need our businesses to be our front line and be able to tell those stories and be conversant in it not to be historians but to be conversant and be able to share their love of their local community and how it ties into the Underground Railroad stories and how it ties into the bigger community to go to the restaurants and support all of those businesses, the, the, the retailers on Main Street. And then, you know, because we are in economic development, it really is about economic development. You know, one of my favorite stories about um, much of this is is Blackwater Paddle and Pedal, Sue Meredith. When we first started talking about the Harry Town Underground Railroad Byway, she raised her hand and said, you know, I love paddling these waters. I bet you other people would too. And has now grown a family sustaining business as a result of this, this work that we've all done together. And she tells a great story. Um, and really, she leaned all the way in. She put her family in, she put herself in, and that really is, you know, a sense of pride for our Maryland residents of, of being this place with this, with this history, as the Lieutenant Governor said, is, is, is difficult, is uncomfortable, but being able to shine a light on it is an important step to moving forward and to keeping the legacy of these important folks going. So I hope I haven't taken too much time and I'm going to turn it over to my my teammate, um, Heather Erse. So thank you. And I'm going to go on mute. Thanks, Liz. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for having us. Uh, and thank you to Preservation Maryland for being a partner in International Underground Railroad Month. Uh, and as you heard uh, Liz say, the Lieutenant Governor announced it International Underground Railroad Month on September 1. It does go for our entire month of September. Uh, and what is International Underground Railroad Month? And Jessica, you can go to the next slide for me. Uh, International Underground Railroad Month acknowledges the significance of the Underground Railroad and all those involved for its contribution to the eradication of slavery in the United States and as a cornerstone for a more comprehensive uh, civil rights movement, for the more comprehensive civil rights movement that followed. It honors the inspiring efforts of the people from around the world who have committed themselves to document, interpret, and share with the public the Underground Railroad. Um, and next slide. So the goals that we came up, and we've been doing this now in part, it's, as you heard from Liz, that this was an, initially started last year. This year has been really a partnership uh, with multiple states, which is super exciting to have other places, other states come and become involved. But we as a group really came up with these goals um, for the for across the, across the states, and then these are our more specific Maryland goals of for International Underground Railroad Month 2020 is to build Maryland's initiative of being the most powerful underground railroad storytelling destination destination in the world, and we'll talk more about that. To inspire the public to travel to underground railroad sites to learn the history associated with individual sites and experience the mosaic of community, regional, and national stories of the Underground Railroad. And then to commit to making International Underground Railroad an annual event, which I think is super, super exciting as this just grows and gets more legs and, and we get more people involved. Um, next slide, please. So as we're continuing to go this month, you can still get involved. If you have a site, if you have a program, 
Uh, we're looking for trip suggestions and tourism opportunities to promote Underground Railroad sites in your county region. Um, and we do have a Google form that I think is can be put up in the chat that if you want to link to and tell us what you're planning or already have in the works for this month that could be promoted as part of International Underground Railroad Month, we'd love to have that. Um, we're looking for those programs, as I said, and then to identify and share web-based content. If you have video, virtual tours, um, as we're all of us are, are going much more virtual right now, um, there's opportunities for that also. Um, next slide, please, Jessica. And then the other things that you can do are to participate in our social media campaign. The website for our social media campaign is at the bottom um, for our industry site at, the, at Visit Maryland. You can also just Google industry, Visit Maryland, and it will pull up our whole industry site, which has great um, resources for our partners throughout the tourism world. I came from the museum world. I wish I'd known about these resources my, when I was in the museum world because there was lots of visitor research there as well as um, what the Office of Tourism is doing to market all of these great experiences. As we know, in the museum world, the first thing that's cut out of any of our budgets, okay, the first thing cut out of budgets is staff development. The second thing, second thing cut out of museum budget, budgets is the marketing budget, always. So here, the Office of Tourism, our local DMOs, our local tourism offices are here to market you and your experiences. So we need to know about them. Um, the other thing is, if you are a National Park Service Network to Freedom site, and we're going to talk more and more about that. Uh, they have a virtual Network to Freedom Passport program this year. Uh, super exciting. Maryland has the most virtual passport uh, stamps available. You have to have a virtual program to put onto the website that people can visit. And again, this is to inspire people, even though they can't, may not be able to come to you immediately right now or come into your, into your building. Uh, they can still at least participate in your program, see what your story is, and and plan their trip and, and be inspired to come see you as once it's, they feel safe to do so. And then uh, we are always and working towards, and this whole webinar is about identifying and researching your Underground Railroad stories in your community and getting those into the Network to Freedom. Um, next slide, Jessica, please. And um, this is a great opportunity this month to really push those to to seek out those stories. Um, and as we hear, as we all know, there are lots of myths and stories out there. And one of the things that are so important about getting them into the network to freedom and getting them documented and researched and having that documentation behind them is is to prove those stories um, because we have to be putting forward a real real history, uh, particularly in the office of tourism or as any of us, it's as you're bringing visitors there, it's got to be the truth. It has to be, and, and that's where this, uh, the Network to Freedom and, and documenting those and having to do the research is so important that it, it gets you through this process. We are here to help you with that and have a variety of ways that we can help you. Um, so you heard a little bit from Liz of why, why the Maryland Office of Tourism is involved in International Underground Railroad Month and really, uh, was the impetus for that, getting the governor announced that, and then really pushing forward to get other states involved and really wanting to see this go go seriously internationally. Um, the Maryland is the most powerful underground railroad storytelling destination in the world, is one of our three major initiatives in our office. This is ongoing. As you heard from Liz, it's been a project for 20 years. It is going to continue. It has, uh, for Maryland, it is just an incredible, um, powerful story for us to both promote as 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 places to go as well as to market as well as as economic development next slide please um so how can we do this uh people have we've had a couple states kind of get their hackles up at us and particularly ohio who's got a very robust story also of the underground railroad and go how can maryland claim that they are the, the most powerful underground railroad story telling destination in the world and here are some of our reasons we do have a um, the most documented success, successful escapes utilizing the Underground Railroad. Um, we have a complex story here in Maryland, and as a border state, it's it is robust and it is dynamic, and there are many individual stories that make up that mosaic of of that collection of of, of the Underground Railroad stories and history that make it an exciting destination to come to because you can experience all these different stories. It's not the same old, same old um, uh, that, that, that is here. And it is, it creates lots of conversation because you have many different people involved from very many different walks of life. Um, so it's, it's a very dynamic history. Um, it is, and it is complicated and we recognize that. And that's another reason that we have to uh, 
tell the real story and the real history as we move forward. We do have the most na uh, National Park Service's Network to Freedom sites in our in the state, so we're super excited and very proud of that, and really work are working towards getting more of those and want to get more of you involved and your sites involved in the Network to Freedom. Uh, Maryland is also home to renowned fi uh, freedom fighters. We have Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass. I mean, you can't look for more of the icons of the Underground Railroad and uh, they were born and raised here. They did both emancipate from here and uh, self-emancipate, and uh, as well as other ones that were, were other freedom fighters that we all need to know more about. Henry Highland Garnett, William Still's family is from Maryland, as well as many others that make up that mosaic. Uh, next slide, please. So along with this is we also now have the tourism products that enable us to reach out to visitors so that they can be they can be inspired to come here, they can plan their trips, and they can use the material to learn as they go through their trip through Maryland. Uh, the Office of, of Tourism has been involved with the Harriet Tubman story for over 20 years. This really was the impetus of the beginning of the Underground Railroad um, for our office. And this was a grassroots effort. Um, this was the community coming to uh, the area, to, to partners and to the Maryland Office of Tourism saying, please, please get involved, please help us. We need to tell this story. So with Harriet Tubman, we have the Harriet Tubman um, Scenic, Underground Railroad Scenic Byway, which is a one of the 18 scenic routes. It is also an America's Byway, so it is federally desi a designated scenic um, route. We have the guide, there's a map, and there's an audio um, app, which is spectacular. I've been in the museum world and, and doing historic interpretation my entire life and life career well it seems like my life um career and the audio guide is one of the best pieces of interpretation i have ever experienced in in my uh my career um very engaging perfect thing to put on the car and put the family or, or friends in the car and, and and drive the route we also have video uh, we have the scenic byway videos we have a sizzle reel these videos are available to anyone in our state um we have b-roll that was was also shot as part of them but we really encourage our sites uh, to, to utilize the um, products that we have already created at your site. Take B-roll, take parts of it, make your own videos, um, however, whatever you need to do. Um, and we have the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center, which just opened up um, three years ago, I guess now. It's time's flying. Next slide, please. Um, so Harriet Tubman has become uh, quite a robust, uh, lots of interpretation material, amazing amazing sites along the way uh, markers in the ground along the scenic byway we've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years with frederick douglas also uh, really spurred by the bicentennial of his birth uh, our office has a map and guide that um, you can can um can utilize for sites across the state both as as when he was here as a young man and growing up and 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 this, as well as once he returned as well as the legacy um some of the statues that are across the state are on this also so there's a variety of of material on this um and these and frederick douglas our frederick douglas story is certainly expanding as we're as we just opened the park with the outdoor exhibits um that whole story is, is, is continuing to expand and will continue as we move forward. Next slide, please. And then our Network to Freedom um, sites have their own visitor guide, their own website as part of visitmaryland.org, as well as a brand new video that Kate was part of last year uh, working with our office to create. And again, these products are all available, but it's getting is sites designated as Network to Freedom sites that then we can pull you into our marketing that is so imperative, but that we have to get you guys documented as those sites to really pull you in. Um, next slide, please. Other partners, this is um, actually another Network to Freedom program is our Frederick Douglass driving tour, which is from Talbot County. They themselves have created their own product and that has become a Network to Freedom program on its own. Uh, fantastic driving to our website. They've just redone again also for the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birth. And the next one, slide please, is a brand new program that Hagerstown and Washington County have created, which is an underground railroad um, driving tour, walking tour in Hagerstown. Um, this will be a Network to Freedom uh, program in my opinion. It has to wait a year to be, to be involved, but uh, shows that our, our individual sites 
can also produce, um, counties and towns can produce their own products that the Maryland Office of Tourism, your county Office of Tourism will help market for you. So um, as people move forward, you don't, it doesn't have to be just your own site that you're creating materials for. Great, and next slide, please. Marketing, Maryland Office of Tourism, Tourism is here to market. And these are our brand new digital banners for International Underground Railroad Month. These are just uh, two parts of the bigger banners that are going out. Ex um, as I, I think incredibly powerful. Again, we have the icons of the Underground Railroad with Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And uh, these are just get you, the idea of getting outside here was very much pulled in this year with, as we're living in the COVID world, of experience, the places that Harriet and Frederick Douglass knew. Um, and the next slide, please, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Along with the marketing, we also really do have uh, our social media campaigns. We have our PR, um, eight PR team behind us. So as we move forward and as you become part of, our, of the products that we can work work with you to create as part of our products um, to, to promote the Underground Railroad, we are happy to do that for you as well as the advertising. And then uh, one of our other roles really is to encourage sites to get involved and become documented and certified sites with the uh, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. As I said, this is your blue ribbon seal of approval that you have a site, it can be documented, and we then can really clearly and and caref um, not carefully, not, sorry, not the right word I want, is clearly and and without question market your site as an underground railroad site and being involved in that movement. And with that, I just invite last slide please, is to join us. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any desire to get your site involved and start getting the documentation going on, we have an incredible team working with the Maryland State Archives with some regional scholars. We have a grant that has come through for the um, 400 years of African American history and culture. Um, so we are here to help you get your sites up, documented, and, and the applications in for the Network to Freedom. So looking forward to working with many of you. Thanks, and I'm going to hand it off to Kate, I believe, who has been a fantastic partner with the Maryland Office of Tourism and is just a joy to work with always, and a fantastic historian. So Kate. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. I mean, Heather, sorry. Kate, I'm handing you over control now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Well, I've been working with uh, Maryland for 20 years, and the Network to Freedom program, it seems almost as long, and as Heather had mentioned, I or um, uh, Jessica had mentioned, I have done over 20 uh, Network to Freedom, successful Network to Freedom applications. They may seem daunting to some people, but once you get into it, it isn't that difficult. The, the real issue is making sure that you can document your site with primary sources. And um, the Network to Freedom folks will help you contact them. They will help walk you through the process. Um, and they have a couple of websites you can Google and also in the resources that were posted here, you can um, look for those direct links to those resources. Um, is it not going forward? There we go. Um, just so you can lay out, the Network to Freedom has sites in most states in the nation. Mo the majority, of course, are along the eastern seaboard. Um, Maryland has, I think it has more than 83 right now, but I know you're trying to get to 100 at least by next year and hopefully by the bicentennial of Harriet Tubman's birth, which is in 2022. Um, and these are rich, rich stories that people have been able to document. And this is what Maryland is hoping that you all can do here. And for those that are have joined on this webinar from other states, you can do the same in your states. The research process is the same no matter where you live. Um, you might think it is difficult in a southern state, but it's possible. And um, you'd be surprised at the number of resources out there. Um, the Underground Railroad paths to freedom went in many, many directions. Don't always assume it went straight north and into Canada. Um, it went into the Caribbean, to Mexico, out west, um, to Europe. So uh, if you stumble across a story and it doesn't seem to fit with the old idea that everybody went north, um, check because that person may have escaped to um, somewhere else. Um, so the key to understanding the Underground Railroad and to doing this research is 
um, as we face many of these um, myths and sort of fake lore and folklore about the Underground Railroad is to remember that the real Underground Railroad was populated with very ordinary people who did extraordinary things to help people uh, find freedom, secure freedom, people who, who fled enslavement and um, took their liberty on their own. And these are the stories that we need to tell. And there are networks of people. So sometimes your research is going to take you along those routes of networks of people. And um, so your research shouldn't be limited to just one place and one person. Your story could span many states and many, many different types of people. Um, so uh, these are stories we all need to hear, especially now. I mean, Harriet Tubman is great and so is Frederick Douglass, but there are heroes everywhere and we have lost their stories and it's time to resurrect them and celebrate them. So I'm just going to address some of the myths right now. And um, some of you might be disappointed and sad or resist this information, but uh, as a uh, I'm an expert on the Underground Railroad and I'm telling you right now, the Quill Code is fake. It is not real. It was manufactured in the late 1990s. So you're using a lot of energy if you want to research the Quill Code. And the Quill Code myths have never, ever, ever told us one story about a real person. And what we want to do is find the stories of real people who struggled and fought and um, achieved liberty and helped other people achieve freedom. The Quill Code is not true, it's fake. Um, the Lawn Jockey is another uh, made up story about the Underground Railroad. It first appeared in 1950 um, and in the research that I've done, lawn jockeys weren't even manufactured until after the Civil War. So these were not used as signals on the Underground Railroad as a as a, a signal to people that this is a safe house. It's totally fake. It's a racist statue. So let's accept it as a racist statue and move on from that. Follow the Drinking Gourd is another myth that was not a song that was sung along the Underground Railroad. This, the song that is sung in classrooms today was actually written and performed in 1947 by the white folk group called uh, Lee Weaver, uh, Lee Hayes and the Weavers. So, and it's based on a, a song that's older than that, but the words are all mixed up and it has nothing to do with the Underground Railroad. Um, so, we have to let go of that piece of music too. Now, Harriet Tubman did in fact use um, a couple of different songs um, uh, along her paths to the Underground Railroad. They were her signals and her signals alone. Doesn't mean anything that she sang was used by other people on the Underground Railroad. The North Star was very real and people did use the night sky to guide them. But not everybody used the night sky. Not everybody knew how to read the stars or even to find the North Star. And we have many uh, slave narratives and testimonies of Underground Railroad successfully escapees and not a successful people um, who said they didn't know how to find the North Star and they didn't know which way to go. But in Maryland, of course, because of the Chesapeake, being able to read the night sky was probably fairly common. And, um, and of course, Tubman used that to great um, effect. And she talked about how the North Star, um, God had put that in the sky for her so she could uh, follow it to freedom. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple of examples of, of stories that are fake. And so this is a, a house called the Edmondson House in East Newmarket, Maryland in Dorchester County. And it had been rumored for, I don't know how long, that, um, that it actually was a secret underground railroad station because it had a tunnel in the back, which of course there was no tunnel there, but they said, well, the tunnel had caved in. And one of the prior, prior owners had started to strip wallpaper off one of the walls in one of the rooms and they came across these names written on the walls. So they said, there's the proof, it's the Underground Railroad. These are the names of the people that escaped and were hidden in this house. Well, researching the names, it turns out that those were names of slave traders from other states, Kentucky and Mississippi and Florida and Alabama and Georgia and Texas and North Carolina and Virginia. 
So not only was that house not an underground railroad station, it was a slave trader's house. And simple research into who owned the house before the Civil War would have shown the owners that. And then, of course, the, the walls are littered with names and numbers. And so it's kind of a horrifying artifact of the true story of the house. And some scholars are fascinated how a house with such a terrible history, uh, a community would come together and try to rewrite the history into something much nicer, but it's not an Underground Railroad house. Um, a house that is, does have a, a tunnel, and it's, I think, the only one out of the six or 700 sites documented in the Network to Freedom program is the Milton House in Milton, Wisconsin. And the tunnel was not built for uh, the Underground Railroad. It was built for the innkeeper whose home was about 30 feet behind the inn. And in those terrible, terrible Wisconsin winters, it was easier for him to travel underneath the, the backyard to his house than to go outside and back and forth in the deep snow. And there is a letter that describes a freedom seeker coming there and they were being chased. So they put that person downstairs in the basement and scurried them through the tunnel to their residence in the back. So that's the example of a, an underground tunnel that had another purpose, but it was used to help a freedom seeker. Um, the Jacob and Hannah Leverton house in uh, Caroline County in Preston, Maryland is another well-documented house. It's one of the only houses on the eastern shore of Maryland that has been documented as an underground railroad site. So there are opportunities there. Um, so start looking for the documentation, but you cannot assume that it is underground railroad because a Quaker lived there or there's rumors that it was an abolitionist house. You need to do the research. Um, so getting to the research, there are so many resources available to people now to do this research. Uh, there are so many things that have been digitized and put online and it, there's a resource packet um, attached to this webinar that you can use to, to check these resources. Most of them are free. Documenting the American South is a website that has hundreds, maybe even a couple thousand narratives on it. You can research those narratives, um, slave narratives, underground railroad narratives, abolitionist narratives. And then there's William Still, the famous underground railroad agent in Philadelphia. His um, records are housed at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and he wrote a book in 1871 um, that he used all of his Underground Railroad records to write and publish. So there are many stories there, and perhaps people from your community are listed in that book. And the book does not include all of the people he recorded in his records, so check both the Historical Society site as well as this book that you can get online free and, and search for free. And um, I just have an example of William Grimes' um, escape story that you can get at the Documenting the American South website, but there are many of them like that. Uh, Wilbur Siebert was a professor uh, in Ohio who spent years uh, interviewing former abolitionists, former freedom seekers, um, and documenting stories and routes of the Underground Railroad in the 1890s before a lot of these abolitionists and freedom seekers died. And his book is a great resource and his uh, files, his papers, his interviews, the original documents are available and in Ohio archives and also at Harvard University at Houghton Library. Um, just one word of caution and that um, Siebert identifies some people in his list of Underground Railroad agents as white and in fact they were African American. So uh, always double check all sources that you use. Uh, runaway advertisements are some of the greatest resources if you're doing research in a southern state to find out where people fled from. And in the Network to Freedom program, you can nominate a site where an enslaved person escaped from, because that helps begin the story and it helps us tell the story of slavery, because the Underground Railroad didn't exist in a vacuum, it existed because people were enslaved and they were trying to run away. So the uh, stories of people escaping are an important part of the Network to Freedom program. And sometimes a freedom seeker flees, but they end up someplace else in a Northern state or out West. And perhaps that state has the rest of the story. So these are really important um, documents to use. And just 
start researching uh, newspapers from before the Civil War and, you know, starting in the 1700s, you can get runaway advertisements. And the Library of Congress has a great free website chronicling America that has newspapers starting in the 1600s all the way up through 1920. So you can use that and it's free. Um, another great source is probate, tax, court, and trial records. Um, the Maryland State Archives is where I have most frequently done my research, but other states have these records available as well. Uh, for instance, on the left hand of the screen here is the uh, probate record for William Spencer. When he passed away, he enslaved Henry Highland Garnett's family, but they fled during his funeral and um, his probate records record all of the people that fled with the Garnets. And they also record the payments they paid to slave catchers to follow them and try and track them down. They paid slave catchers for 10 years to track down Henry Highland Garnett's family. So that's a great resource. Also trial records where these two um, men, freedom seekers from Dorchester County fled and they had forged freedom passes and they were caught and arrested, tried and convicted. So those prison records, uh, court records are available. In tax records, at least in Maryland, people paid taxes on enslaved people. And when they ran away successfully, the tax collector deducted those enslaved people from an individual's tax record. So that's where you can find uh, freedom seekers as well. Uh, the Underground Railroad Journals of William Still, I mentioned earlier, he published many of these, but also the original is at the Historical Society and it is available online. Um, you can see that resource. Um, and this over here is the Boston Vigilance Committee records. Those are available online as well. Um, and that resource packet that you have available um, lists the sites that you can access for these records. Um, Sidney Howard Gay's records at um, Columbia University are a fabulous resource and he sort of was connected to that eastern uh, branch from the Chesapeake through to Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia to New York City and he records uh, amazing stories about people running away including Harriet Tubman. So look for the records there. He talks about Underground Railroad agents and not only is his journal really helpful but his letters as well and between Harvard and Columbia, I think they have 40 years worth of letters that um, Sidney Howard Gay wrote. So these are the sources um, and this slide is available in the packet as well. So, you know, there are so many ways to discover the stories of freedom seekers. We need to tell the story of where they fled from so we can fully tell the story of, of slavery and just about these heroes who risked their lives, enslaved people, free African-Americans, uh, white people, others who just were part of the uh, Native Americans in, in different communities that helped freedom seekers reach freedom. And we need to tell those stories and, and um, share those American heroes with the world. Thank you. And I'll pass it off to Dennis. Thank you. And Dennis, I am handing you control now. Okay. And you should have that. There we go. It's a slight delay. So I'll, I'll start and I'll start, I'll just give a brief presentation that really will talk about how we look at the Underground Railroad uh, within Maryland on a local level. So talking about work, the work that's been done in Prince George's County. Um, and then um, I'll talk briefly, but then I want to get us back to uh, more of a discussion between all of us here and then to uh, the entire audience as well. And so uh, the first slide there is just the, the um, definition that you can find on the National Park Service Network, the Freedom website, which I think is important. And this kind of links back to something that Kate was just discussed, the, discussing. And so I'll, I'll read that, the Underground Railroad, the resistance to enslavement through escape and flight through the end of the Civil War refers to the efforts of enslaved African-Americans to gain their freedom by escaping bondage. Wherever slavery existed, there were efforts to escape. And so then that just goes on further. I'll skip and, um, and down to the end. 
many freedom seekers began their journey unaided and many completed their self-emancipation without assistance. But each subsequent decade in which slavery was legal in the United States, there was an increase in active efforts to assist escape. And so when we are talking about this network of freedom, when we're talking about these sites to tell the story, it's always important to remember that there's a long history, there's a long chronology beyond kind of the, the figures that we automatically think of like a Harriet Tubman or a Frederick Douglass. And so thinking about all of this as a part of the network to freedom and, and stories that we want to, to be told if they're not already being told um, at sites throughout the state of Maryland. I think it's frozen. Okay, let me, sorry about that. Let me uh, try to click forward here. Are you seeing the next slide? Yes, I am. And so, okay. um, so that slide is just pictures of, um, so I work for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, which is a bi-county agency, which includes Prince George's County and Montgomery County. And so on the Prince George's County side, we have uh, five uh, historic sites that are part of the Network to Freedom. Um, and there are much, many more in the county, but these are the sites that are operated underneath the umbrella of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And so there you just see some images, Northampton Slave Quarters and Archaeological Park, which is in Bowie, Maryland, um, at the top. Uh, then on the bottom left, you have the Marietta uh, House Museum, which is in Glendale, Maryland. And then on the bottom right, you have Darnell's Chance House Museum, which is in Upper Marlboro. I think it's still not moving forward for me. <laughs> okay, Dennis, sorry about that. I will go ahead and click forward for you. Just let me know whenever you want to move forward. Okay. We're having uh, some <laughs> sorry about that. No problem. I'm gonna... Apologies. There we go. There we go. And, and then the next slide, these are uh, two other sites that are part of the uh, Maryland National Capital Parking Planning Commission. And so with these two sites, I want to talk a little bit about stories from those sites of the Underground Railroad and the Network to Freedom. So at the top, you have Mount Calvert uh, Historical and Archaeology Park, which is uh, located in Upper Marlboro, which is under the um, supervision of our archaeology program. And then on the bottom, you have Riversdale House Museum, which is in Riverdale Park, which is also uh, a part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission uh, in the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, if you go next slide. And so one of the stories from Mount Calvert that can be told as it relates to um, this uh, Underground Railroad, the Network to Freedom, is the story of the escape of Jenny Henson in 1814. And so uh, Jenny Henson appears in the historical record in the late 1700s, but we don't know much about her uh, and, until 1814 when she makes escape for her freedom. And this happens during the War of 1812. The British are right there at the river, which you see in this beautiful image of Mount Calvert. They're right there on the river, the Patuxent River, outside of Mount Calvert. And so uh, Jenny Henson decides to uh, make her escape. And so how do we know about this? We know because of the historical record that's left because after the War of 1812, uh, these uh, plantation owners uh, uh, submitted claims to the state of Maryland, and so which are available through the Maryland State Archives. And actually, you can get some of those that documentation available online. But because they submit claims to be reimbursed for their property that has run away, uh, we have information about Jenny Henson running away in 1814, in August of 1814, to the British. Um, her husband goes along as well. He is on a neighboring uh, plantation, Billingsley. Um, and so also we know the fact that they escaped. We also know some details about them. And so um, Jenny Henson is described as being crippled. So she has some sort of disability. We know something about the work that she does. And so that's another um, kind of body of evidence that talks about, that gives us information and insight to um, African-Americans sla escaping from slavery. And I think this particular story is important because it allows us to see the importance of times of war um, in opening up opportunities for African Americans to escape. And so we also think about the Star Spangled Banner Trail, which is another uh, important trail here in our state of Maryland. 
that intersects very much with this story of the Underground Railroad, Railroad and, and the story of escape. And so we have not just at um, Mount Calvert, but uh, many places uh, in, in the region where uh, the African-Americans used this war as an opportunity to claim their freedom. Um, and, and you see the little um, small picture at the top. And so that is just an exhibition uh, that the archaeology program did in conjunction with the Black History Program, which is my office, in 2016, which told this story as a part of a larger story about how archaeology is important to telling African-American history. Uh, if you go to the next slide. And so at Riversdale, we have a, a very rich story of the Plummer family. And so on the uh, left, you have Adam Francis Plummer. On the far right, you have his wife, Emily Saunders Plummer. And in the middle, you have an uh, image of um, Adam Francis Plummer later in life, surrounded by his children. Um, and so the Plummer family uh, just kind of briefly tell their story because it is such a rich story. Um, Adam F Francis Plummer is enslaved at the Riversdale uh, Plantation, which is owned by uh, George and Rosalie Calvert. Um, he learns to read and to write. And, and as a result of that, he, um, he uh, begins to keep his own diary. And so that diary becomes an important historical record to learn about his life. And so this particular site is interpreted um, as a network to freedom site through the story of Emily Saunders Plummer, his wife. And so um, in the early 1840s, 1841, to be exact, um, Adam Francis Plummer and Emily Saunders uh, marry. Uh, they're on uh, different plantations. So he's on the Riversdale Plantation, which is in Riverdale Park, right near College Park. Uh, and then she is on the Three Sisters Plantation, which is in Lanham, Maryland. Um, and so they marry. They actually are unique in the fact that they are allowed to marry in a church. They marry in the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Um, and then because of kind of their unique situation and status, they initially be began to think about running away in the early 1840s and 1845, to be exact. And they, they come up with this plan where they're going to use the marriage certificate that they have and use that as freedom papers that they can use to sneak away to Canada. Uh, unfortunately, the plan is told by a family member and they're unable to run away. Uh, there does not seem to be any repercussion to Adam Francis Plummer, but definitely Emily Saunders Plummer uh, experiences uh, repercussions and is sent out into the fields to work. Uh, and so then much later, actually in the 1860s, in the midst of the Civil War, Emily Saunders Plummer, uh, at this time their family has greatly expanded. They have numerous children. And so at this time, Emily Saunders uh, Plummer again decides to run away. This time she's on a plantation in Howard County. She runs away from that plantation with her with a few of her children. Um, unfortunately, she's caught and then sent to a jail in Baltimore. Um, but uh, it's, of course, in the midst of the Civil War, you think of all of that's going on during this particular uh, historical time period. Um, her uh, enslaver is unable to come up with the funds needed to get her out of the jail. And so she's released. And her husband comes and he gets her and their children and takes them back to Riversdale. So that's part of the story that's interpreted at Riversdale a part of, uh, as a part of this larger story about the Plummer family. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. And so real briefly, some of the lessons that we learned from looking at the stories in Prince George's County is the fact that ongoing research is needed. And so even um, if you've done a network to freedom application or you're going to do one, that doesn't mean that you can that you have to stop doing the research. There are more uh, resources that might come available. There are more people that know more uh, historical interpretation that might come out that might cause you to look at something different. Uh, so at, I think the process of ongoing research is important. So, for example, the story of Jenny Henson, which I mentioned, is not mentioned on Mount Calvert's application because that was something that came out later when the research was being done for the Star Spangled Banner Trail. And so that just expands and enriches that story. Um, exploring overlapping history. So once again, thinking about how the stories of wars, that being one example, is something that intersects with the story of the network to freedom and escaping slavery. And so I think that's an important point. Engaging the community, and that can be, and, and Heather mentioned some of this as well, and how that's an important part of telling these stories when you're engaging the community, engaging descendant communities. And so uh, one of the great things that the staff um, at Riversdale House Museum has done over decades has engaged with the descendants of the Plummer family. And, and through that, they've been able to hear these oral histories and collect that information, but then also pair that with 
the information that has been left in the uh, written historical record. So as I mentioned before, um, Adam Francis Plummer left a diary that's currently in the, the collection of the uh, Smithsonian uh, Institution. Um, the, his daughter wrote a history of the family. And so that is another important resource that's able to come together. And that's all because of this relationship that has been built over time between the family and the staff at this historical site. Uh, and then also, as, as I mentioned before, like giving us a broader understanding of, of what the Underground Railroad is, both in terms of chronology and in terms of actors and in terms of, uh, of the types of escapes. Uh, next. Opportunities, I think there's some definitely a lot of opportunities for Prince George's County, and these are other opportunities that we can think of in other parts of the state of Maryland. And so one of the things I think is an opportunity for us in Prince George's County, so you'll see the image on the left is a man by the name of Anthony Bowen, who was enslaved in Prince George's County, eventually gets his freedom and moves to Washington, D.C. and becomes a, a, an agent on the Underground Railroad. And so there's a possibility there with, um, we quite haven't figured out what we're going to do yet, but we want to uh, do some sort of programming, which might be some sort of trail, might be some sort of audio tour, might be some sort of bike tour, but something that connects the story of Washington, D.C. to the story of Prince George's County. And so I think that's important for all of us to think about is not just to think about our stories within, and this, some of this has been mentioned by both Heather and Kate, not think of our stories within just this kind of uh, limited uh, geography, but think about them as this larger um, geography that uh, extends beyond jurisdictions. And then also on the right, you'll see just this image that represents uh, enslaved African-American women. And so those stories are important to, uh, to tell. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, I think the research for that is much harder to uncover, but uh, doing that work is important. Uh, and I'm reminded, thinking about this, reminded of the great work of um, historian Stephanie Camp, and she talks about enslaved women in resistance. And, one big part of her uh, work is talking about the whole form of truancy, which is kind of like um, um, people going for quasi-freedom. They go short distances, they don't stay for long, but they do that to improve their situation, whether they're running away for a short amount of time to uh, until their situation gets better, until the master does something that will better their life. And so thinking about that also as a story and, and why she talks about this truancy is because that's the form of running away that you see enslaved women engaging in more than you do see uh, enslaved men. Uh, next slide. And I won't talk. I won't talk too much about this because I think we'll get into this uh, in the uh, questions. But also, we have to think about what are the opportunities and what are the challenges right now as we try to uh, share these stories and program around these stories amidst amidst the pandemics. And so, talking about COVID nineteen, but also talking about um, this uh, reckoning in American society with. Uh, racial inequality. And so thinking about what are the ways that we can tap into this moment, moment because um, I, I'm sure Heather can talk to attest to this to some extent, definitely in Prince George's County, we see where there's even greater interest in African-American history. And so um, we know that at times for those of us that work in the field, sometimes it can be a struggle to get people interested in history. And so we need to capitalize upon this moment now. Um, and so right there, you'll just see two images of some programming that we've done uh, earlier this summer, related to programming we did earlier this summer. And so one was we did a virtual Juneteenth celebration. And so that's not necessarily directly related to the Underground Railroad, but part of uh, what we do in this program and what we did in this virtual program is share stories of African-American history. So for example, we talked about the work that's being done uh, in Montgomery County and our sister organization, Montgomery Parks, with bringing the Josiah Henson uh, Park online. And so the important story of Josiah Henson, who is the model for Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom, and so his story of escaping slavery as well. Um, and then we had a, um, a, and then just the other image is an image from a, a local artist, actually a Baltimore-based artist, who created a work that spoke to um, the this historical moment in which we had an artist talk with him talking about this. But I think we'll talk a little bit more about that as we jump into the conversation. I, and I want to move us into the conversation because I don't want to take up too much of our time. So if we could close uh, that out. 
And I guess the to begin, I guess I would I would go to Kate and then also ask Heather to chime in on in this, on this as well and, and ask if you could talk a little bit more about um, Harriet Tubman and your work on Harriet Tubman and her as this um, huge figure in the story of the Underground Railroad and then talk about what are the kind of the opportunities but also kind of what are the drawbacks and the challenges with her story and so talking about that from uh, connecting that to what you talked about in terms of the myths of of um, the Underground Railroad, but then also I think we can definitely relate it to Heather relating it to tourism, and what are the you know the opportunities that the Harriet Tubman story offers us in terms of tourism, in terms of talking about Maryland as the the most important state when we talk about the Underground Railroad. Oh, Kate, you're muted. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Um, so when we're talking about Harriet Tubman, my work, I've been researching her life for 25 years. Um, and so, and I'm always finding new material about her. This probably could happen to any person that you decide to research. But the, the resources are out there to uncover the stories of other people. Tubman offers an opportunity because people are used to hearing about her and her story is so rich and she had so many connections that um, looking at the people that she worked with on the Underground Railroad and she did follow a network or two or three or four. So you can find other freedom seekers through those networks. So she is a useful tool to use for research if you're trying to find other stories. Um, the drawback is everybody thinks of Harriet Tubman and she becomes the stand-in for everybody's story. And so we're all hoping, and in Maryland, I know you're all hoping that so we can, Tubman is just it and celebrate her, it's fabulous. But let's find those other heroes. Let's find those other people. And I think of um, when I was doing my research on, on Tubman and her Underground Railroad stories, coming across William Still's journal and letters from Thomas Garrett, the Underground Railroad, agent in Wilmington and he they wrote about um, an enslaved man by the name of George Wilmer in Kent County and in a two or three month period in 1858 I think it was he brought 20 people through Wilmington and into William Stills office in Philadelphia so you know who is this person he should be celebrated he was an enslaved person that was bringing people to freedom and going back himself and bringing more people out so that gives texture and a whole different landscape to understanding the Underground Railroad. Just think of the people in the communities, Tubman's community, other communities that kept the secrets. They were part of an amazing network and they did not betray the, 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 the work and, and, and uh, efforts towards freedom, but they just chose to stay behind because of family and whatever. So that's really important. The, the Tubman can be used in many different ways, but don't let her overshadow your stories. Great. Uh, I've been, I don't know the rest of you, but I've been scribbling as we've been, been sitting here, uh, hearing the rest of my, my panelists along with me um, with other notes. I've got, I've got post-it notes all over my desk already, again, with other ideas and things that go down, other avenues to pursue. So with, um, with Dennis's question about Harriet Tubman, uh, I'm going to jump on the ability of with you know, Harriet is one of those icons, and and, and we forget here in Maryland, um, we're we're typical with, with Maryland with this. We we kind of we tend to be blase about things. You know, we always think of UT and 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 you know, University of Texas or University of, of Tennessee, and people being so gung ho, and we're just the same here with Maryland. We're we've got Harriet Tubman, we've got Frederick Douglass as as as, as some of our icons that are from here, and we don't always completely just take them in um and and celebrate them to the to the nth degree they should be um but they do provide provide that opportunity for us and with that some of the fun things that can you know we can use as i don't want to say hook and hook is a horrible word for this um as a as a as the uh leader um is for things like the bike tours dennis mentioned the the bike tours from maryland into dc um we're really looking mm -hmm. at turning we we do not have any named bike tours in maryland and one of the ideas for next year would be to do this the harriet tubman scenic underground uh, railroad byway 
as and do the bike tour along it. Again, we can start with that one because it has the name of Harriet Tubman in it that's going to enable us to then have this, this leader for the rest of our named bike tours, mm -hmm. um, as well as for smaller bike tours like the one that Dennis mentioned that could be a, a neighborhood bike tour or you know in, in between two towns. Um, the other thing that we're planning for uh, that, again, will take us multi-state would be a Harry Tubman legacy tour that would go from Maryland up into New York and into Canada so that we can link these her her route um, and create that visitor experience. And as Liz was already was talking, also start getting those multi-state um, mm -hmm. underground railroad scenic byways going. Um, so, you know, Harry gives us that ability, um, both both Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass as those leaders that enable us. But as, as Kate said, those other stories and that creating that mosaic of those stories is so important. And each one of those individual stories gives inspiration and 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 name and and the ability to honor that incredible um, gumption of people and and to give to make the each of our places more robust and and even more dynamic. Um, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland, and, and Henry Highland Garnett is one of those people I knew nothing about growing up, and I, he's he's right there in my community. Yeah. Um, and those are the types of things that we need to to help in our state also is get those stories out so that we are all knowledgeable and we and we all have have that inspiration of all these stories um, and then could travel to those sites of course and see those places and and have time to reflect and think and and honor um, so great question Dennis so I think that also could can lead into us and I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll turn over to the audience after I ask this question, just because I want to make sure that we have enough time uh, to get questions from the audience. But how can we, what are the benefits of digging deeper and more into this story uh, in Maryland of the Underground Railroad from, you know, from a tourism perspective, but then also from other perspectives? So I, I'm immediately thinking about uh, one of the things that we're doing a lot in Prince George's County and in other places in, in Maryland is, is having more uh, conversations about truth and reconciliation as it comes in terms of uh, racial inequality. And, and specifically, this is happening a lot as in talking about the uh, work on lynching that's being done in the state. But that directly relates to a lar larger history of racial violence and de directly relates to slavery. And so we can talk about how digging into this history is an important part of having those conversations and having those actions that follow those conversations for truth and reconciliation in Maryland and uncovering the truth of what Maryland was. So, cause sometimes it's blurred, I think, when we talk about Maryland as this border state, but talking about this real history that's in Maryland. So the question is, you know, what, what, what do you all see as the benefits of digging deeper into this history in Maryland uh, as it relates to the Underground Railroad? You want me to say something? Yeah, go ahead. No, you go, Kate. Um, well, as an historian, I want all those uh, forgotten stories to be remembered, and I want communities to value the history. Some of it is very unattractive, but we have to also look through that unattractiveness to find those communities and people and individuals who survived, who struggled, who fought, who rose above and did extraordinary things. And, um, and I think by doing that, you engage communities and you bring back memories because so many memories have been obliterated on purpose, not on purpose, but we've got to bring the memories back. We have to address them, confront them and embrace uh the legacy and and also have a pride of place because there are so many rich stories to be telling but we've got to tell the truth <laughs> uh liz i think you want to totally say agree with that and um i think uh, the other part of it is actions when you tell a true story when you tell reality and you decide someone else's part it is Bullshit. I mean, Frederick Douglass, I believe, said at some point, I'm going to, you know, probably botch the quote, but that's how you show respect. You have to show the person who's talking to you and the person who's, um, person, you know, get that connection. So much can happen to advance going forward. 
And I'm having a slow network connection, so I don't know if anyone heard any of that. <laughs> we heard a little bit of it. Uh, parts and pieces. Um, and I'm going to hop in with uh, something of a great example that's happening currently. D Dennis just kind of touched upon of, of communities that have have not brought these stories forward. Um, in Kent County, we've got the heart of the Chess uh, heart of the uh, Chesapeake project going on between um, Washington College Star Center and the Smithsonian African American History and Culture Museum um, of actively going into the communities and unfortunately COVID's slowing it down a little bit but it's it's shifting there again they're finding ways of doing this differently but the idea was to take actually vans full of equipment into communities traditional um african-american communities in on the eastern shore and start asking these questions of of bring those stories forward bring bring them bring photographs bring um bring manuscripts you know things that are the family history that and, and again, I think I think so often what's happening now is particularly having a wonderful Smithsonian for African American history and culture is that um, the feeling that yes, we we all we do everyone does want to hear this history, and for so long communities have felt that they weren't supposed to bring their history forward or weren't supposed to tell their stories, and I think all of this makes us much more dynamic as as a as a society, as a culture, as a state. Um, and and as those as those family stories come forward, you know, I've I've already got my fingers in that project, saying if you hear any underground railroad stories, you know, please <laughs> please put them down and let's let's follow up on them. Let us help you follow up on those stories and let's see if we can find some, you know, document them and and, and get those forward. So great opportunities. I guess now we'll open it up if there are questions, um, Jessica. Yeah, there are some questions. Thank you so much, Dennis. And um, some of them you have kind of talked about. Um, one kind of very uh, quick question that would be uh, targeted, I think, to tourism is if, along with the Underground Railroad sites, are there lists of um, Black-owned businesses throughout Dorchester County or um, some of these other things to tie in both to support uh, Black-owned businesses while touring Underground Railroad sites? Liz, do you want to take that? Let's see how our connection's doing. Part of that. Um, yeah, I think my connection's kind of funky. So maybe you should take that, Heather. Okay. So um, it, it sounds like the question's particularly for Dorchester County. One of the things that uh, our office has been working on is doing certified host um, program or certified host program. So business going out to businesses, having them become certified hosts. For the Underground Railroad, and, and this program actually started with the Harriet Tubman, uh, with the Visitor Center opening, so that as visitors came to Dorchester County, the, um, the entire county, all frontline people, everybody in the front lines could one speak about the Visitor Center, talk about Harriet Tubman, and know her, uh, have a brief biography of her in their heads, um, and then also promote what are other opportunities there were to do in the county to have that person or that group extend their stay in the county so um, we really had had geared that program and and again I grew up on the Eastern Shore so I, I I was that 16 year old waitress in the in the pizza joint and and had you know that's who I had in mind as we were developing the um, video that went with it. there's a training video it's designed to be a 30 second or 30 second 30 minute uh, training session that you read uh, Kate Smith's and um, Truths of the Underground Railroad, a Harry Tubman biography, um, why was the Underground Railroad in Maryland, um, and then you know really smile, tell the tell those visitors what else, to, where else to go, what else to do. But with that certified host program, um, businesses had the ability. One, we asked them to carry the, the maps and guides for the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad byway, scenic byway. Um, they also had window clings that indicated that they were available to talk about. Um, or had staff that was knowledgeable to talk about the byway and the experiences in the area. So um, for specific black owned uh, businesses, uh, the, and then that list of certified hosts uh, is available on our website and is available in the material that is sent out to travelers requesting information from our welcome centers as well as our, our fulfillment and call centers. Um, so that's how we were really helping businesses get both trained to be knowledgeable to talk about uh, the Underground Railroad Byway, or Scenic Byway out there, um, and Dorchester, and, and Caroline, and actually Talbot and Queen Anne's and Worcester have all come on board now because they've, and um, 
and Wicomico because there's so much people, so many people traveling through that area to come to the Harriet Tubman Visitor Center um, mm -hmm. and experience the the, the scenic byway and the, and the sites out there. So. Um, and so the uh, next question is: So we've gotten all this great information. Um, there's so much research to be done. How does this work get integrated into um, school curriculum? Good questions. That's uh, for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can speak a little bit to that. So the Network to Freedom program does have um, like a junior ranger booklets that um, you now it's all it's becoming virtual. So you should contact the Network to Freedom program um, and they have the resources for uh, at least for junior ranger, but you could use that in a classroom. As far as the research that is uncovered in your communities, um, you know, it's hard to have teachers integrated into school curriculum because they have these set um, resources already, but you can talk to, you know, your state's Department of Education about bringing in some of this information and, um, and helping teachers uh, include it from, you know, first grade on. So uh, it, it really is up to communities to ask their educators to do this. But check with the Network to Freedom program because they may have some great ideas for you. I think it's definitely important to think, um, to be in connection with um, people in the educational field and the local school boards to see what's going on um, right now because of everything that's going on, as I mentioned before, talking about the racial pandemic that's going on, talking about how people are becoming more aware of racial inequality in, this, in society. I know at least in Prince George's County and a few other places in Maryland, there is a movement afoot right at this moment to do more, to incorporate more African-American history into uh, local school curriculums. And so um, I think we uh, who are the historians doing the work or, or, or people who are engaged in this work in some sort of way, whether it be through history or through tourism, need to make sure that we're at the table because i think a mm. lot of times these conversations these conversations and actions happen kind of in a silo or, and the people that need to be at the table are not at the table and so i think we have to do a little bit of our, our own research to find out what's going on right now and then make sure that we have a seat at the table to make sure that this work is included uh right. and what's added and expanded upon at this right. moment and I agree, and I'd like to say, and it's, it matters how this history is interpreted. Uh, recently, there's been a huge controversy about a nationwide curricula uh, supply corporation organization, and they've written new um, African American history for elementary schools, and they have a, a segment on Harriet Tubman, and they have her dressed as a burglar. So, you know, what were they thinking? And, so this is important that, yeah, people need to be around the table and have knowledge on the interpretation and the history uh, before it goes out to the classroom. Yeah, some of the most, um, and again, uh, for us, it's it's uh, uh, bus tours, uh, school trips to to the sites. Uh, hopefully, you know, once the Harriet, Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center is open again to the public, um, their school numbers have been just off the chart, which is great. Mm -hmm. They have a pavilion on site and picnic area so that you can bring the kids can bring lunches, have a place to sit down, which is often the problem with field trips. Um, the other thing right now is the virtual. There's so much virtual stuff right now going on. Particularly, I'm going to put out the National, uh, the Network to Freedom Passport Program. We've got 30 sites, 35 sites. It's going to continue to grow as more sites come on online of virtual experiences that you then can get your passport for your passport, um, you know, your National Park Service pass passports book or create your own Network to Freedom one. They have a, one you can do virtually or print it out and, and do it. Um, so, and then, and then on the other side with the, some of the best history lessons I've ever seen are from kids themselves doing history day program um, projects. And all of our schools in Maryland are required to do history day projects. Um, Underground Railroad stories, these individual stories are perfect uh, projects to research and then present either in a dynamic uh, performance uh, video or acting or exhibits. I mean, there's there's a range of ways that the information can be put forward from the students, but those students doing that research is, is also some of the best teaching where often teachers are uncomfortable to to deal with the subject. And I think often students are, are your better teachers and, and more honest often. I just wanted to piggyback yeah. on what uh, okay. Heather, Heather said about the virtual programming, because I think that's so 
important and, and we can see that as one of the maybe few uh, positives of COVID-19 is that it's opening up this whole new avenue of education for people in the public history museum field. And, that, and it looks as though it's gonna be something that extends beyond once things get better, that there will still be these strong virtual components. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can say in my own experience, I have had educators reaching out to me that haven't reached out before about wanting to get more information that they can incorporate into their virtual classrooms. And so I think if we get our foot in the door now with these stories, with this history, it will just continue, we'll continue to have these relationships that extend beyond 2020. So there's one question, which is a bit of a research-based question. So. Um, you know, we have some tools that talk about where to find these materials, but then the other piece is about um, the choice of language and the words and terms that are used when they're um, the question or asked about like enslavers instead of slave owner, freedom seeker instead of runaway. Um, and so are there resources to kind of help people learn how to talk about these issues and, and um, kind of use um, both to their terminology, but also um, uh, how to speak plainly about the topics. Well, I know the Network to Freedom program has a link with information on language and how to use it, what the language is now that is being used, why, and so that there's an understanding of, of the differences. So I would check out their website. Um, you could do that pretty quickly. I know academics are talking about this all the time and things are changing uh, rapidly. Um, so, but I, I would check with the Network to Freedom program and, and download their, their guide. And I think another place to look definitely is the, um, the great work that was done with the New York Times with the 1619 Project. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in there about language as it relates to the history of slavery. Yeah. So another uh, research-based question is, um, you know, I think Dennis, you talked about it a little bit, and Kate, with all your fantastic online resources, there's, you know, and certainly, you know, the tourism has a lot of stuff. How is COVID impacting the ability of sites to be able to go out do their research? Is um, can you talk a little bit about how COVID and um, research and Network to Freedom have have interacted? Uh, well, my interactions with the Network to Freedom now is it's all virtual and um, and doing the research, it's all virtual. I, I haven't been to an archive since, I don't know, last winter. Um, I know that some libraries and archives are opening up slowly and you can request items. Um, the other thing is to uh, for people living in communities, you have public libraries, many of them have online resources. And as a community member, you can request that your library uh, purchase other online databases. So in this new COVID world, check to see if your library system has the funds to get a particular newspaper database that would be helpful for your research. Um, and, and so many states now are uploading a lot of their historic documents online. So check with your individual state archives. The Maryland State Archives, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the best state archives in the nation as far as getting a lot of stuff online. And uh, hopefully someday in the future, uh, you all be able to have a, a seminar with them because they, the folks that work there, Maya Davis and Chris um, Haley and their staff are just incredible. And the resources are there. Don't let anybody tell you you cannot research African-American history before the Civil War, because yes, you can. And there are incredible stories there. And we need to find people. We need to name them and name them every single day. And it can be done. I think that just to put back on that, I think Kate makes a great point about the uh, local libraries. I was just listening to a story about the Enoch Pratt Library and how they're purchasing uh, more databases. They might not mm. be databases that are helpful for this, but <laughs> libraries are doing that. And you don't have, for Enoch Pratt, you don't have to live in the city of Baltimore to get access to, to get a library card and have access to those databases. So that is something that is happening now. Even thinking of, think about local universities and, and how you might get access to the database collections that they have and that they subscribe to is also something to think about. Yeah, and for sites to think about, I mean, what's nice, what was not, was, with not having visitors as a, as a museum site right now with being closed, you have, should have more, hopefully some time to get some of this, of this kind of research done. You've got interns still standing at the door wanting to come work with you. These are great projects to put interns on 
and or have staff do while you've got when well, you don't have visitors walking in the door. Um, so use use the opportunity of of hopefully some some quieter time uh, without those folks to to get some of this some of this other research done. Um, so I think kind of to um, where we just got a few more minutes. So um, you know a couple people have said something coming in the question saying that you know they do have sites that are jails or what you were talking about earlier with the reverse underground railroad and are the you know not the the uplifting story of going to freedom but the realities of that there were setbacks and that there were hardships and um, that there are places that do have ugly pasts so how do we make sure that those stories it's not well that's not part of the underground railroad how do we integrate to make sure that those stories are also part of the underground railroad narrative uh, can I just would like to t give another shout out to the the Tubman byway um, because the the community came together and they wanted this byway and Maryland tourism just went all in and there are sites along the byway that are culturally important sites they may not be linked to the Underground Railroad but they are their churches and there are other sites so wherever this history happened we can tell those stories even if it's not attractive history and um, or it's painful history it's just it's but we have to tell these stories and those sites are important some of the sites can go on the network to freedom i know the reverse underground railroad is something that the network to freedom is now considering as part of the network to freedom sites um so you know check with them but i i think maryland has done a great job promoting efforts in communities to raise up these stories the the good the bad and the ugly Any other? Okay. Um, so I guess just kind of um, we are at our time, but um, just one question that was asked a couple times in um, it's just kind of a good basic thing to leave everybody with. If someone has research or if someone has updates um, to the work that's been previously done on their site, um, how do they go about getting that um, getting that to you, Heather? Uh, you can put my my contact information is you can always email me is the best way these days um, heather dot erst e r s t s at maryland dot gov um, and I'm sure Megan will throw that into the chat for us. Uh, you're welcome to send that to me. Um, I am in contact with Diane uh, at the Network to Freedom. Often we also have a new regional representative for the Network to Freedom, so we have now two two people to work with through there, and um, as well as the team here of historians at the State Archives, as well as some regional historians. So um, yeah, send it along and, and we'll, we'll keep working with you. And Liz has got... And no, um, Liz... just... Oh, am I muted? Okay. Um, <laughs> Industry.visitmaryland.org. Heather's information's there. Our checklist is there. Anything that you want to know, because there's your site, and as it relates to the Underground Railroad and Network to Freedom, but it also is an attraction in the state of Maryland, and it can tell you all those other resources that we have at a glance, easy to navigate, so, and lots of good re research there um, as far as visitor stats and that type of useful information to those that are waiting to welcome people back after COVID or through COVID, so industry.visitmaryland.org. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. We do have some um, site specific, ugh, can't talk, site specific questions that have come in. Um, and so if you had one of those, I am um, copying those down. I'm copying your name down. I'm going to email it out to the appropriate person um, and see if I can maybe get you an answer um, on those site specific um, questions. Um, well, thank you all so much for um, your participation and for joining us today. And thank you guys all for your fantastic questions. I know we weren't able um, to get to everyone, um, but like I said, I will keep kind of sending these out to the panelists. Um, this presentation will be ready as a video. So if you came in late or if you had to leave early um, or if you know someone who you think might enjoy this, it will be up on our website. Um, by tomorrow, probably, um, and as you guys will also be getting an email, um, a follow-up email if you are on this, um, with both this video as well as the uh, links to the resources. We send up a page that has kind of everything in one stop, uh, one stop shop. So, thank you again to our panelists, and thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.